the five key steps to a perfect 850 credit score. I know, it sounds a little bit too easy. Well, largely because it is. However, I'm not here to say, once you watch this video, tomorrow you're gonna have a perfect credit score. Mm -mm. First, you're gonna have to dedicate the time to really understand what it is we talk about in this video. And second, most importantly, you need to have the patience to execute consistently in order to achieve an 850. But if you can do both of those things, I have no doubt at some point, you're gonna get to a perfect credit score. Hey folks, and welcome back to the channel. For those of you who are new, my name is John of John's Finance Tips on TikTok and on Instagram. Today's video is gonna be a good one. We talk so often on this channel about all the various different types of credit cards, but I think fundamentally what we need to discuss is how do we even get to qualifying for some of these credit cards? I mean, after all, I do talk about a lot of premium travel and luxury cards. And with a lot of these travel and luxury cards, you need a good credit score. And so in today's video, let's set that foundation for how we can get a perfect 850 credit score. You might not think it, but in my opinion, I think a credit score, those three numbers are probably one of the most important numbers that you have, period. I'd say arguably maybe even more important than a social security number or your driver's license ID number, because this number could potentially keep you from renting a house. This number could potentially make you pay more for car insurance or potentially cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars in excess interest payments on a 30-year mortgage. And so with a number so important, why are we not taught about it in school? Why are we not given the steps necessary early on in high school, even in college, to achieve a solid score? That one, I don't know. <laughs> but what I can tell you is in this video, I'll give you exactly the five steps you need to do to be able to pull down a solid credit score. I will say though, right now, as much as we're talking about the perfect 850, oftentimes with credit, good enough really is just good enough. What I mean by that is if you go and get a 30 year fixed mortgage on a house and you have a credit score of 760 or roughly or higher, you're actually going to get the same interest rate as a person with the perfect credit score. However, the person with the perfect credit score has a little bit more buffer on the month to month or week to week fluctuation in a credit score. So that's something to keep in mind. We're striving for perfect, but in this particular instance, good enough it's kind of good enough. This list is gonna go in order of most important to relatively least important. The thing that I need you to all keep in mind is this is all going to take time and patience. Time to understand the concept that we talk about and patience to execute consistently week over week, month over month, year over year. And as somebody who's had over 40 credit cards, multiple houses, I can absolutely say having a solid credit score makes any credit related decision that much easier. Easier. Really quickly, just a level set, credit score versus your credit history or credit profile. Your credit score, you can think of it like a term or school grade point average. Your credit history or credit profile, think of it as every single quiz or exam or homework throughout the semester. And at the end, you end up getting a GPA, that's your credit score. Now that history is gonna tell a lot of context, but oftentimes at the end of the day, we just care about what is that GPA. And so for a lot of creditors, they just care about roughly what's the score? Is it good or is it bad? And there are two different scoring models. The most common that we're gonna see is FICO. You're also gonna see one from Vantage, but really we're gonna focus on the FICO scoring model today because largely for a lot of credit, auto, and home loans, it's gonna be based off of the FICO scoring model. So the FICO scoring model is composed of five key components. Number one is going to be payment history. Number two is your credit utilization. Number three is your age of credit history. Number four is gonna be your credit mix. And number five is gonna be hard inquiries. And in that order, I'm gonna start with number one, the most important of all is gonna be your payment history. This accounts for 35% of your credit score. And this is by far the most important. It's probably the easiest one to understand because as the name implies, are you making your payments on time? The pro tip here is if you miss a credit card payment or any sort of loan payment by just a day or two, it's not gonna ding you on your credit profile. It really starts to hurt at the 30 day mark, 60 day mark, and 90 day mark. Now I'm not saying, oh, you know, I'm gonna miss it by a day or two, it's totally fine because John told me, mm -mm, make your payments on time, always. But what I am saying is, don't freak out if you might've missed by a day or two, because it usually isn't gonna get reported all the way through to the agencies. Some of the tips that I would have to stay on top of a ton of different payments and bills that you might have, 
One, can you automate your payments? Can you just select, hey, you know what? I know my credit card bill is gonna hit every month. I'm not spending a whole ton on it. I'm just gonna automate that payment or my mortgage payment or my auto payment or my student loan payment. Can you just automate that and make it one less thing that you have to do to know that, hey, I'm gonna hit that every single month because that is gonna be the most important determinant of your credit score. Two, credit utilization. This accounts for 30% of your overall credit score, almost as important as payment history, just slightly less weighting. Now, with credit utilization, here is how it's calculated. Basically, you take how much total debt that you have divided by your available credit limit. And typically, what folks say is keep that under 30%. I recommend keeping that under 10%. Now, you also might be thinking, you know what, if lower is better, why don't I just have it at 0%? That's actually not as good as you might think it is because you still wanna show kind of all the credit lenders and credit agencies and bureaus that you're getting your credit and you're using it responsibly. Because if you get it and you don't use it, well, they don't know if you're actually risky or not. So my recommendation is keep that sucker under 10%. And in order to do so, let's say you have a credit line that you know you don't really use that much, maybe just charge a $5, $10 once a month pay it off, you're good to go. The pro tip I have for you is there are two dates to be mindful of. There's the statement close date and your due date. The minute that the statement closes is when your credit balance is reported to the credit agencies. So let's say, hypothetically, you've got a $10,000 credit limit and you bought something for $8,000, but you have all the money, you have all the money and you're gonna pay it off. However, if on the statement close date, that $8,000 is reporting against a $10,000 credit limit, that's 80% utilization. Even though you're gonna pay the whole thing off before the due date, 80% utilization is gonna get reported to the bureaus and that's gonna hurt you. So what I would recommend, keep aware as to when that statement close date is. And before that date, try to really pay down as much of it as you can. And so let's say that $8,000, you pay down 7,500 of it. Okay, now it's $500 over a $10,000 credit limit. That's gonna be way better for you. And then at the due date, just pay off the rest. And that's how I would make sure I'm keeping my utilization low, but not exactly at zero, because you still wanna show them, hey, I'm responsible, I'm using it, look at me. One thing to also keep in mind with the new FICO scoring models, they wanna look at your pattern of utilization. So what that means is, are you utilizing more and more over time, less and less, or kind of keeping relatively stable? This is for the new FICO scoring model called FICO 10. FICO 8 doesn't actually incorporate that currently. Uh, FICO 10, I believe, is launching or has launched. I don't know exactly when, but just keep that in mind with new score models, they're actually gonna look at trends and patterns over time. Number three, the age of your credit history. This accounts for 15% of your total score. And as you can see, compared to the other two, it's not as important. So there are a lot of components that go into your age of your credit history. One, they basically look at how old is your oldest account, period, that's it. The second is looking at the average age of your entire credit profile. So kind of my guidance here is if you have one account that's been open since basically day one, don't touch that account. Use that every now and then, make sure that that account is active. However, if you're kind of in the same game that I'm in or kind of doing what I'm doing, which is opening cards, getting sign up bonuses and all that good stuff, it's not a big deal if you end up closing cards after about 12 slash 13 months. The average age of your credit history takes into account all of your credit lines that actually report to the bureaus. And here's what I mean by that. If you open a card and you close it in good standing, that account will actually stay on your credit report for up to 10 years. So it doesn't really matter that you opened it and after 13 months you closed it, as long as it was in good standing, that will continue to show up and age on your credit profile for 10 years. It ends up actually helping you over the course of the long run. And so not a big worry. However, do not close your oldest account ever. And it's just that one, the one oldest. It doesn't matter if you opened an account 10 years ago and one nine years ago. The nine years ago one doesn't really matter. It's the one 10 years ago that's really important. That's one. And two, if you open a bunch of different cards, like, oh, John, like I've got like four or five cards open in the last two years. Should I close some of them? As long as it's not your oldest, it's totally fine. Now, some of you out there might be thinking, well, isn't it gonna hurt my credit? I close account and it hurt my credit. Why is that? The reason closing account might hurt your credit has actually to do with credit utilization. Let's say for instance, you only had two credit cards, all right? And each card had a $5,000 limit. So you had $10,000 of total limit. Now let's say hypothetically, you had say a $2,000 
charge across a $10,000 credit limit. Stay with me, that's a 20% utilization. It's not bad, it's not great, it's just like, eh. Now, what happened? Now that's 20%. Now, take one of those lines, close them. Now you have a $2,000 charge against a $5,000 credit limit. That's 40% utilization. That is how closing a credit card can hurt you from a utilization perspective, as long as the card is not your oldest card, period. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But again, it's only 15%, so I'm not gonna fright too, too, too much about it. But if I were playing this game, I would keep my oldest line open, period. And then kind of anything new, not too concerned about it. Number four, coming in at 10% is credit mix. Basically, do you have different types of credit? The two main ones are gonna be installment and revolving types of credit. So installment credit basically means that it's a fixed payment, typically over a fixed period of time. Think of student debt, think of auto loans, think of mortgages, that's an installment-based type of credit. The other type, revolving, is gonna be credit cards. They vary, it's not for a fixed duration of period of time, and it's really important to have a mix, though it's not as important as the first two components, which were on-time payments and low utilization. I would definitely not recommend anyone to go get a different type of credit just so that they can have credit mix, because again, it only counts for 10%. On the flip side to it, if you pay off an auto loan, a home loan, or your student debt, and now you go from you know, having a couple different types and maybe only one or two types, you might see a slight ding, but do not worry, you will recover in the long term. I would not hold off on getting rid of debt simply so that you have a credit mix for this pretty measly 10% total of your credit score. And coming in at number five is gonna be increase or hard pulls accounting for 10% of your total credit score. I would say across all of them, this is probably the one that I worry the least about, actually, in addition to credit mix. Hard increase just basically means they're pulling your credit, checking your credit. To a creditor, that might seem risky because they say, oh wow, John's getting his credit pulled a ton. Is he seeking a ton of credit? I don't know, that sounds scary. Well, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. What's also nice about hard increase is after two years, they're gonna fall off your credit profile. And after one year, they really don't really have that much of an impact. Now that's still gonna be on your credit profile, but just saying that it's not gonna ding you as much as say the very, very first year. But even that ding, like for me, I'll be honest, there was a point in time where I was probably getting about anywhere from eight to 12 credit cards in a year, which means I had anywhere from eight to 12 hard increase in a year. There are sometimes I had three hard increase in a day. My credit score probably fluctuated in that period between like a 780 to about like an 830. So again, I didn't particularly care. Yeah, there's gonna be a ding, but at the end of the day, I knew A would recover and it only accounts for 10% of my credit score. My pro tip with hard increase though, if you're really cautious about it and you don't want people just pulling your credit, go ahead and put a freeze on every single one of your credit profiles. Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, all of them are actually super simple. You can make a free account, freeze your credit. And a myth here is that people think, oh, if I freeze my credit, you know, is that gonna hurt me? No, it just means that people can't go and pull your credit without your permission. And I think the place that this is the most egregious is going to a car dealership and somehow you end up giving them your social security number and you're talking about financing and they've pulled your credit like 20 times and you're like, what's going on here? Because to them, they wanna find you the best rate, but for you, it could actually end up dinging you. And again, I think that's just silly. So my recommendation for everybody, because this is what I do, I have my credit reports frozen all the time. If anybody needs to pull it, they can say, hey, John, I need to pull your credit. I go, that's great, why? And if they have a good reason, I go, okay, and I unfreeze it for say 24, 48, or 72 hours, they pull it, I refreeze it, and that's so I can have total peace of mind. The other reason could be from an identity protection standpoint. If at any point someone stole your identity and they're trying to take out loans in your name, well, if your credit bureaus are frozen, they can't do that. So I would highly recommend doing it. It's 100% free to do for all the bureaus. And that's it, folks. Five steps to a perfect credit score. Now, as you can see, there are two that are probably the most important, which is gonna be on-time payments, 35% and keeping a low utilization at 30%. In cumulative, that's 65% of your score right there. The others are important, but they're definitely not gonna drag or boost you as much as those first two. So really, really focus on understanding those and the rest pretty much is gonna come in time. And when I say time, let's talk about that. So 15% comes from your 
age of your credit history. And what they see with those who have perfect or near perfect scores is an age that's close to about seven years or so. I know you're thinking, oh my God, seven years, I just got started yesterday. And that's the thing, remember what I said, time and patience, it is going to take some time to get to that perfect 850. And it's about probably around seven years or so you're gonna start seeing those numbers really tick up there. That's not to say you need an 850. Remember, you wanna just be in the exceptional, excellent, very good bucket, which typically starts around 760. 760 to 850, those people are getting the same interest rates. Of course, if you want the 850 to gloat, it's gonna take some time, but again, practice all of these five key core components and you will get there, no doubt about that. So folks, I appreciate all of you tuning in. This has been an amazing video. If you have any comments, questions, please drop them down below. If you're interested in any credit cards, of course, they're linked below as well. And I'll catch y'all on the next video. Peace.